And we can say the same things that we were saying out there, except for now, maybe everybody can hear it, right? Yeah. Bullhorns are not always the best. <laughs> Microphones are a lot easier. Or when you're Kendra, she just has that voice. <laughs> I'm just a little, uh, as you probably already noticed, we're running a little bit behind schedule. Thank you for your patience. Um, there were a couple of things that started off the day beyond our control. So we got started a little late. Um, and Mr. Hayes is upstairs right now finishing up some um, prior engagements. And then he will be on his way down. And uh, so we are running behind schedule. But that doesn't mean you don't get something. You get me right here talking to you. And, I know, which is terribly disappointing. But here's the deal. So I came to this museum as a child. One of, one of the first kids through a summer camp when this museum opened in this building. How many of y'all remember when it was on the fairgrounds? Right? So our history is as a planetarium. So you can say that our history was in the stars. It was written in the stars. <laughs> and so um, this museum has a very special place to me because I am who I am today because I came to summer camps here and because I took part in programs here. Without it, I would not have found the love of science. So when we talk about what we do with museums, it definitely matters. It makes a difference. But that also means that I've been here a really long time. I started here. I've, um, uh, after coming here as a child, I went on, got my degree in physics and chemistry, but then came to work here in 1994. Don't do the math, that shows you how old I am. <laughs> but one of my favorite things to do is say, ask me anything. Try and stop me about this museum. Find something I don't know, because I feel like I've been here long enough that I know everything. So all the questions you've always wanted to know, uh, raise your hand and we will take questions from the audience before and then I'm also, in just a little bit, I'm going to take some questions that you want to ask Fred Hayes so we can make sure we get it on the list. And I'll answer the first question for you. Why isn't it called Omniplex anymore? <laughs> right? For a time, on social media, the It Will Always Be Omniplex had more followers than Science Museum Oklahoma. I was one of them. <laughs> but now let's think about that. So all of us that know it as, um, as Omniplex probably grew up here, had a lot of love for it. But think about if you didn't grow up here and you saw this building and you heard the word Omniplex, you'd be like, business complex, movie theater? What is it? There's not even windows in that building. So we had the opportunity to rebrand and kind of um, reinvent the place. And so then we became Science Museum Oklahoma because now there's no question about what are we, where are we? We're Science Museum Oklahoma, not Science Museum of Oklahoma because we are all one. We are all Oklahoma. So that's the number one question I usually get besides how do astronauts go to the bathroom in space. And I'll let Mr. Hayes go with that one. <laughs> so, so raise your hand if you've got a, a question about this place. Anybody? Right there in the middle of the back. And I'm going to ask um, one of our volunteers to listen for the question and then repeat it for me. Because I threw my hip out yesterday because that goes back to me being old. And I can't do these stairs the way I used to. All right, young man with a hand up. Tell Lane right here in the beanie what your question is and he'll repeat it for you. It was a stretch, it wasn't a question. Anybody else? Right here. Uh, yes. Oh, that's a great question. How long has Science Live been, been a thing? Um, a long time. Now, it didn't always live as it is now in this auditorium, but Science Live is actually bur uh, birthed as a live science show called What is Science? I could probably recite it by memory right now. And then it turned into, why don't we do it into the auditorium? So it's probably been in the auditorium for 10 years, maybe? A little longer than that, yeah. A little longer than that. Yeah. But it started just with a live science show out on the floor. And we didn't always have facilitators in the building doing shows. So, there's a question down here. No, 
Oh, another one over here. Oh, gosh, now we've got actual hands in the air. Yes, and the hat. That's the, my favorite question of all times. Why was the Science Museum named? Well, we started um, as a planetarium on the fairgrounds because of a man's vision named John Kirkpatrick, who was an incredible visionary for our city. And you've probably seen the name around on more than just our building here, because we are Science Museum Oklahoma in Kirkpatrick Center. Well, John Kirkpatrick had a vision that the community needed a place to be inspired about science, to be the, to nurture the inventors of tomorrow. And he started with a planetarium. And in 1978, we opened this building that we're in now, Kirkpatrick Center, because he thought, wow, wouldn't it be awesome if there was a whole shopping mall? You can go to the shopping mall and you can buy like underwear and you know, tops and stuff, all in one, under one roof. So why not get all of your culture under one roof? So we um, opened as Omniplex Science Museum, Kirkpatrick Planetarium. Um, we added on to this building in the early 80s with the Aviation and Space Museum and Hall of Fame. Little known fact, we built the building around the train car. It wasn't always over there. We just built the building around it. And then in 1997, we merged the art, science, and aviation to become Omniplex as one. And for one time, we were Kirkpatrick Science and Airspace Museum at Omniplex. And so it was really because we are the museum that our community deserves. It was a great vision for it. And I heard a question over here. Yeah, you. Tell me about it. You. Please rename it Omniplex. Did you not hear my big, long-winded explanation about why we're not called Omniplex anymore? But thank you for giving me this opportunity to draw this out even more as we're running late. <laughs> it's, here. Here. Every, but you know what? There, here's the great thing about calling it Omniplex. You can call it Omniplex. You can call it Science Museum of Oklahoma. Because no matter what you call it, it's usually said with memories and, and fond remembrances. So it's usually meant with love. So as long as you say it like, oh, There's only one. Omniplex, Omniplex and not. Omniplex. You can call it whatever you want. Not, it would make all of us happy. The fact you're here makes us the happiest of all. Okay, strong. All right. Yes. Oh, there we go. Yay. Hello. Uh, I was just wondering what the oldest exhibit is, not in age, but like longevity. Longevity. That is a fantastic question that we just talked about the other day. It's like I should pay you for asking that. Um, so there's a lot of um, exhibits in this museum that were here when we first opened. And somebody asked me the other day what my favorite exhibit was, and you can't pick a favorite, but I have one that I have a lot of memories with, and it was one of the oldest exhibits. And as far as durability, it is the tree that you, you clap and it lights up. The enchanted tree. How many of y'all have seen that? That's awesome. Yeah, the enchanted tree. There's no pedestrian. Sure. It was one of our first exhibits in this museum. And Here's a little Easter egg for you. The gentleman that made it, he put his business card. Is this a doctor man? The is this a tiny doctor man? Daddy? 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 The, 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 the tiny dot is the man. The tiny dot is the man. Because if you ever have anything go wrong with it, the tiny dot is the man, Daddy. Right there. The it's tiny still there. Dot is and nothing yes, is going yes, yes. with it. That is the most durable, best exhibit ever. And, I love, and when we were talking about it just the other day, I was like, I wonder if anybody's ever called that number that's on there. <laughs> Not saying do that, but, <laughs> but so it's um, an incredible fun exhibit. It's been here the longest time. It stands up the test of time, and it's just a really neat experience too, so. But it's also one of my memories, one of my memories from when I came here. I have a question on the yes. back row. Okay, great, do it. Because I can't see because there's some lights. What is it going to get remodeled? What is it going to get remodeled? So, no, I love that question because one of the things we hear about a lot here are like, everything's broken, nothing ever works. We have over 400 individual experiences that we have a team working on it all the time. And so we have three specific galleries that change out at least once or twice a year. So there's always something new. 
Now, one of the things, like as you're sitting in this auditorium and you're looking at these red chairs and these red curtains, it's like, man, this science theater has looked like this for a really long time. Well, we're actually seeking funding right now to revamp this so we can really build it into a bigger, better theater with more energy efficient. So one of the things that we're working on now is how to make this building more energy efficient. And we've replaced all the carpeting. Uh, you might not know that when this building opened, it did not have air conditioning. That's one of our favorite things in the summer now. <laughs> So we're constantly up and we're constantly renovating, but one of the things that we do have to, just like with any institution, you have to um, weigh what you are able to do versus what your resources are. We are a private 501c3 nonprofit. We don't receive any city, state, or federal funds. Um, we are supported just by donations and ticket sales. Not, you know, because the zoo gets um, sales tax from the city. We don't do that. A lot of people think we do, and we don't. So we reinvest in ourselves. That's why we don't do a lot of traveling exhibits and we don't do a lot of things that are just temporary because we want to invest in the long term. We want to do it for permanent good. All right, yes. Question over here. Um, uh, one question was, uh, I have two questions. Is that all right? Let's just stick with one right now because now we've got to get questions about right now. Okay. Um, question, do you have any... Uh, uh, like pipe organ related exhibits. Did somebody pay you to ask that question? <laughs> do we have any pipe organ related exhibits? We don't, but do you know we have got a pallet of pipe organ pipes? Up, and I don't know, what, hey Mary, is it in collections or is it in exhibits? Where we have all our pipe organ in exhibits? <laughs> the back dock where things go. <laughs> So um, the, the person who had my job before me, Don Otto, loves pipe organs, and somebody gave him an eBay account and a credit card. <laughs> and so he bought all these pipe organs, uh, pipes, and we actually turned one of them into a train whistle. So, right? So when you hear one of the big train whistles out there, I think it's one of our pipe organs. All right, well, thank you. Okay, I'll take one more, because I do love talking about this place. Um, I'll come back to you. I'll take two more because I see two hands up there. Can somebody grab one of those questions right there with going like this? Yep. I really could talk about this place. I'm not kidding. I love this place. It's, it's amazing. Who came up with the idea for the exhibits? Who came up with the idea for the exhibits? With the <gasps> oh my gosh. So who came up with the idea for the exhibit? That's one of the best part of working here is getting to think up new ideas and being creative and, and finishing the sentence of, wouldn't it be cool if, dot, dot, dot. So that's kind of the basis of all science. Um, so the staff, the staff comes up with new ideas, our community comes up with new ideas. We have a lot of community partners that help us think up new exhibit ideas. We just got a big donation of trains that are gonna help um, refurnish our train exhibit as well. So a lot of it comes from opportunity and a lot of it comes from dreaming and, um, when you have a suggestion, I'm not saying that we can do it every time, but we do love to hear ideas. Uh, I have a love of trains and would love to see more of the trains. And we always keep a file of really neat things that when the opportunity comes, we try and explore it, uh, adapt it, or expand on it. All right, we're gonna do, I promised her a question right here. You did. I did. Okay. Okay. We'll do, okay, do, we'll do yours and then we'll come back to you. All right, go ahead because we are actually getting close to front of time. So I experienced your older planetarium. I yes. to be here on opening night for the way it is now, and I see you're getting a new one. Can you tell us about the new one? Yeah, baby. So that is the next new thing on the horizon. Um, is our brand new planetarium that will open fall 2024. We will have one of the most state-of-the-art planetariums in the world. There is only one other planetarium in the world that has equipment, not better than ours, but basically that will have the same equipment as ours. Because it is um, a hybrid planetarium that has digital and optical projectors. Digital, because we want to be able to download and present content. Optical, because those are the best stars to look at. So not only will we have the absolute best stars, we can even use binoculars to go see, it will have um, digital presentations so we can show video and download things from NASA on the spot. Um, 
um, we needed a new planetarium because again, our roots are in a planetarium. We also did a community survey that said they love the planetarium. And if you come on spring break, you'll be waiting about an hour to see a planetarium show. So it was a really good idea to invest in that, to have um, more seats, better projectors, bigger screen. And so it um, just so happens that when you have a domed Omnidome theater, the dome is just the right size to fit a planetarium screen in that's a little bit bigger than what you got. So we'll be dropping in a new planetarium screen. The outside of it does not get demolitioned or demoed. Um, that's a question I get a lot. The outside will remain. We're going to pretty it up a little. We'll have a new planetarium screen on the inside. And why, yes, we are fundraising for that right now. So <laughs> thank you for asking. Um, we are hoping, we, uh, thanks to the Loves family and an anonymous donor, we are five and a half million dollars in to an eight million dollar project. And so we, that's why we started construction on it and we have been subject to steel delays, supply chain issues and all that, but we're, I think we're back on track. And uh, for it to be open by fall of 2024, we've just finished all the demolition and now we're starting the construction. So the second story is gonna be an entirely new, huge planetarium over there where the Omnidome used to be. All right, now to the final question before we get to Mr. Hayes. What will happen to the old planetarium? We're gonna put it in a glass case and shine lights on, no, we are. We're flattening it, we really are. I know, it hurts, but progress hurts sometimes. And I did the first time. Uh -huh. Right? So that is really cool. And if you see the, the things that are around the planetarium right now, those images were actually done by somebody who used to work at our planetarium and is now one of our major donors for the planetarium. And so we might be keeping those. So I joke that we're, ah, we're flattening it. No, we're not. And it is coming down, but we are keeping the important parts of it for posterity and for um, election issues. And here's this. The, the, that is actually going in a glass case because it is beautiful. And it is art. And it's going to be on display outside. So this question was, what about the star ball? And so our current star ball uh, is going to go on display outside of the new planetary. It is not fairly new. It is very, very old. <laughs> it's not the original, it's the almost original. Yeah. And you might even, just a few years ago, you will probably listen to like slide projectors going ch 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 All right? Yeah, we love our new digital system. So we are repurposing the equipment from our current planetarium to add and enhance to the new planetarium. All right, thank you all so much for your patience and for indulging me because I really, really, really could talk about this place all day long. And so now we're going to get down to business because I hear that we are, hold on, let me check. Oh, I have 29 missed texts. I hope one of them is, we're on the way. And it's not, but we're getting really close. Um, so let me take care of the housekeeping rules here. Um, first of all, again, I just I say it a lot, but I really mean it. Thank you for your patience. We control the things we can, and this is the and we're doing our darndest to to get keep things rolling and moving. Um, so thank you to our sponsors. We have two big sponsors for our event today. One is um, Soulbird, Fly Soulbird, and um, Oklahoma Aviation. And Sho Kassam, the owner of that, yeah. stepped forward when we had the opportunity to bring Fred Hayes, an Apollo 13 astronaut, to Oklahoma. He stepped up and said, let's do it, because we wouldn't be able to afford it. So yes, thank you to Solar and Oklahoma Radiation. And we also had a fuel sponsor that helped fuel the planes for getting here and back to Houston. Bob, what's the name of that? It's AV uh, Atlantic Aviation. This is what happens when I don't have my notes in front of me. Atlantic Aviation helped with that. And, and Bob Castle helped with that. So thank you all so very much for helping this happen. So a little bit about um, Fred and Bob. Uh, I'm sorry, Bill, Fred and Bill. Bill Moore is an Oklahoma author and icon who has done so much, he's in the, um, the Oklahoma Historian Hall of Fame. He's been a co-author on many, many books, and he worked with Fred Hayes, 
for many years to get Never Panic Early put into print. And that's something that Fred had always talked about, Never Panic Early, oh, we'll know when it's time to panic. And so it, came, it became a natural title for the book. And you'll read a lot about it when, um, when you get your book, if you haven't already read. Um, the things that Fred has done, I mean, Apollo 13 was pretty amazing, but when you look at the stuff around that, we have an absolute amazing human being here who's also one of the kindest people on the face of the planet. And um, <clears throat> so when they got together to do this book, it was just, it just made sense for Bill to do it and for it to be about Fred. And I asked Fred on the way over here, so Apollo 13, I read in the book that, you know, you were having to solve some problems and all that, but one of the things that actually went through your mind wasn't, am I gonna live? It was, I don't get to walk on the moon. So that's kind of heartbreaking because he had trained and um, he had done two missions ahead of that in preparation for Apollo 13. And this was his time, he, he was up. And so it was one of the, those moments to where you really learn a lot about a human being. It wasn't, am I gonna live? It wasn't, how are we gonna get out of this? Am I, how are we gonna get back home? It was an emotional tie. And that comes from a time when we were uh, really now. pushing exploration. And that's why it's really important what we do today is to help push exploration. And that is why Fred said he wanted to come. And, and see everybody is to help push exploration, to help push creativity, critical thinking, and a lot of STEM content for kids today. And um, look to space, not to screen, is one of the things I've heard him say. And that can help you build grit, it can help you build um, uh, perseverance and willing to fail and try again. So I love that whole never panic early, kind of let's, let's think, think it through before we get too late. Although I do want to ask him, maybe we do that later, um, when is the time to panic? Because we're pushing it right about now. <laughs> um, so we are really excited and thrilled to have him. And I would like to be able to take some of your questions to Fred because in order for everybody to have an opportunity to get their book signed, and we do have a few signed copies available in the shop that if you don't want to have to wait in line, you can buy a signed copy in the shop. But um, we're going to try and get as many people through as we can for the, writing, for the signing of the books. We're going to do a short Q&A ahead of time. And then we'll go move over to the signing. And just to make it orderly, we're going to go row by row for the book signing. So that way you don't have to wait in a long line. You can wait seated. So it just makes it a lot of, easier on everyone. And we want it to be a great experience for you too. All right, so who has a question that they would like for me to write down? which I will have to get my iPad, or I will forget. And we'll see if we have time to be able to ask Mr. Hayes and Mr. Moore. All right, right. Vaughn memory, now, I'm an OSU grad. <laughs> but I actually want to know the answer to that, too. <laughs> All right, so let me turn on my notes. And let me turn on my little microphone. A fond memory about the time at... <coughs> <laughs> I know. I'm for all Oklahoma teams as long as they... Are, don't write that name. Um, as long as they're not playing each other. All right. I saw a question. Yeah, right here. Hey, I'm not asking for stage direction here. <laughs> he's talking, he's telling me where I need spotlights. And you actually probably know a lot about that, and I should probably listen to you. You're right. Because um, it's kind of dark in here. We'll bring the lights up here in a bit. Have you seen what we do in this theater? I think you're looking at the burn marks that need to be cleaned. Right? <laughs> He's, he, he's like the, the curtains are the words, like, yeah. Oh and coffee, oh, I'm sorry, um, Dust of Doom is dirty. I found the water! If he was disappointed, he couldn't um, finish the Apollo 13 mission. Yeah. <laughs> 
and, and what are some tips that whenever you, what are some tips or some tricks he can give us when you are in all these to keep the level and what steps to handle Because he's an expert at that, right? How do you keep the level ahead in a never panic or early situation? <laughs> all right, well, who's got a microphone over there that can pass around so I don't miss anybody on that side? I'm the only one with the microphone, so let okay. me know. And we're on the same side. side. Yes, I'm on the Logistics. Right. How about a green right there? Right here? Yeah. Um, I wanted to know how his perspective on life changed or if it changed after going what he went through with that. Exactly. How that has the perspective of life changed after a couple What are thoughts of UI, um, UIPs, UAPs, Unidentified Aerial Phenomena? It's not UFOs anymore, it's Unidentified Aerial Phenomena. All right, let's take one over there on that side and then I'll come back to you, sir. Where's my microphone back Okay, you're serious. What was Taker off like? Ooh, you should read the book. <laughs> What was that? It can be, it can be, if there's an audio book. <laughs> um, so what was takeoff like? I like the words um, that he uses about G's, because you all know what G's are, like, and how many times of gravity it feels like. All right. The first one is, was it really that cold when the power was out when we were sick? And then the second one is. He has some comments about um, how he was portrayed being sick in the movie, too. What would be one thing that you would change in the movie, and how would you make the movie better? All right, so what was one thing that you would change in the movie, and how would you make the movie better? Um, we've actually talked to him about that. And so in order to give um, time for everything, I know it's not the same coming from, them, from me as it is from him, but he did say he would change how they portrayed him being sick, because he really wasn't that sick that they did in the movie. It was a dramatic interpretation. So um, let me see those, and if I could take a picture of those. And I know we're not going to be able to get to all the questions. I have a young man over all here. All right, let's do it. What, what did it feel like when he got back on Earth? Ooh, what did it feel like when you got back on Earth? Oh, I bet you it was really heavy. That's a great question. Let me write that one down too. Let's see how we're doing over here. Hi, we have several STEM teachers here today. And so our question is, we are teaching the new Artemis generation. Um, what advice can he give us as educators uh, to promote that problem solving and um, that love for space exploration? That's a great question and thank you for being here. Yay! Yeah, and what would you recommend to promote problem solving and critical thinking in, touch, touch, in never handed early situations? I have one more. Video. Okay. Um, uh, future history teacher here. Um, do you believe that space exploration contributes to pride and patriotism, or is it space exploration about expanding human knowledge? Can it, can it be both? Oh, I, want, I want him to give me that. I know, right? <laughs> but you got me thinking, it's a good question. Okay, so let me make sure I have opinions right. Do you think that space exploration is more about Pride and patriotism or more about in advancing human knowledge. Oh, cool. Okay. Why did why did we are Oh, so the question is 
Christian is now our auto mascot. So he's probably recharging is why he didn't come out. Because sometimes his batteries get drained and he gets a little toasty and we can't have auto overheating. But he told me to tell you he's sorry he missed you. When does his battery stop charging? I don't know. That is a good question. How do they get charged up with the flags? I have a gentleman here who has a question. All right, let me have one more question and then we'll get up to you. Um, my son is turning 16 and he wants to go either into NASA or space or since he wants to Great question. What advice for somebody going into NASA or Space Force, right? So with everything they had going wrong, what was the importance of being able to do all those calculations manually? That's a great question. And in the book, and you probably look in the book now and see, there's a picture of all of his hand calculations that he had to do for oxygen tank and battery life. And they had to do it on the fly. All right, all right let me check in, because I'm seeing the right people down here, which means that we might, again, thank you all so much. And we, um, let me check in out here, because I see Lindsay. Hi, Lindsay. How are we doing? Great. I see you down here, so that means it's good. They're on the right way! Oh. Oh. <laughs> All right, let's keep going with some more questions. Let's see, I cannot see a thing. Okay. I got you. Yeah. All right. Bill astronauts not use the analog slide rule, so will there be a presentation on how to use the old analog slide rule? He did not bring the slide rule. Somebody's talked to him about that. <laughs> do you know how to use a slide rule? I learned how to do That's how old I am. I learned how to use a slide rule, but I never had to use a slide rule. All right. What inspired him to write his book? I think Bill Moore lit a fire under him. Right. What does he think about the Artemis program? So here's a little known fact. Um, just two days ago, they were testing a rocket engine for the Artemis program, and it was tested on the Fred Hayes test pad. Right? So that's pretty cool. Um, and I, I am really excited to see where Artemis goes. So. What about training? Did he enjoy the most? There's somebody sitting here. Here's my phone. I'll try to get um, Just an, another side note, just so you guys know, because we are running so late, we are extending the time that he'll be available for, um, for signing, because we don't want to short you guys on your time either. For your patience with us. We have our question. Oh, go ahead. We have our question over here. Uh, as Oklahomans, we all recognize that we all support our Oklahoma Army and Air National Guard members thoroughly, which, you know, go soldiers. Actually, Fred Hayes was an Air National Guard member for some time, so my question for him is, does he still view himself as alumni of that veteran collection, and what's his relationship to the state of, with the Air National the Guard or the Army National Guard of Oklahoma? What do you mean the audience, Daddy? What do you mean the audience? My iPad actually picked that up from the museum, so thank you. I took a speech class, so I took it very nicely. <laughs> Good job. Uh, my question for Mr. Hayes would be, knowing what you know now, would you volunteer for a Mars mission? Would you volunteer for a Mars mission? How many of you all would uh, sign up and go to Mars tomorrow? You all are awesome. You all are awesome. Because think about what it would take to get to Mars. That's nuts. It would be a long time. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Uh, what is something that you'd like to tell people about your career that we usually don't think to ask about? And he's like, 
I can't think of anything. <laughs> They're headed this way. Yay. I will say, yeah. Um, I will say, Fred has been, again, he's just an amazing individual. And he I is um, 89 years old, so he's just moving a little slowly. So, again, thanks for the patience on that. And these are really, really great questions. I'm going to see what I can do to get a, um, to as many of them as possible, but I also want to make sure that we have enough time to sign books. And um, try and think. Oh, here's, what, here's a question. Those are lots of really great questions for astronaut Fred Hayes. Does anybody have any questions they would ask co-author Bill Moore, Oklahoma historian icon? Right there. There have been a lot, of advances, a lot of advances in technology because of the space program. Mm -hmm. um, just build more things goes for the patent regardless. Just would have taken longer. Alright, so would, there's been a lot of advancements made in space um, technologies in general. And, uh, and would those have happened anyway without the space program? Yeah. <laughs> All right, we have some books here. I see some more people. How are we doing? Hi, everybody. This is Mel. Buy your book. All right, so, oops. Hi, come on in. It's, he has All right, any other questions you might ask Bill Moore? board member right here, Mike Diva. So all the really wonderful things that happen in the museum is honestly because of our board members. True. She's a little wonderful. Um, he's probably interviewed a lot of the Apollo astronauts. What is the common thread of all of them? That's a really good one. So I like that one. I'm writing that one down. <laughs> so yeah, Bill has um, been involved. Did you know that Oklahoma, I'm sure you guys already know this, and that Oklahoma has had an involvement in all of the manned space missions from the very beginning. So Oklahoma is a, a state that is rich in aviation history, and Bill has chronicled almost all of it. And so he probably does have a great answer is what is the common thread that goes through that? And, uh, does anybody know why Oklahoma has such a rich history with uh, NASA and the space program? I'm going to butcher this story. It actually comes down to a school in Weatherford. Does anybody know the story? Because you can probably tell it better than me. <laughs> Bob, you know it? Yeah. Uh, so one of the people that was hired by NASA was from Weatherford, from <coughs> Southwestern Oklahoma State University. Folks. And, um, they found out that they needed more engineers, and the guy was like, hey, I know where we can find them. And it just so happened that he had that relationship with Weatherford and the school there. And so that's why they started turning out engineers that went into the space program and why we have such a rich aviation history in, um, in, from Oklahoma. And Bill would probably murder me for how I told that story. <laughs> but it has something to do with OSU, uh, Southwestern Oklahoma State University. All right, yeah. Oh. Great. Oh, yeah. All right. So how many of you all, so you'd go to Mars, but Mars is obtainable. Mars you could get to in a, you know, what, a couple of years? How long does it take to get to Mars? Seven months, a year. So let's round up to a year. Where's your line? How far would you be, I mean, like, where do you say that's too far that I won't go? So you guys said you'd go. So how far would you be willing to go if you couldn't be in like a hypersleep? Would you go two years? What if it took like three years? Because we don't we don't have Enterprise yet. We don't have 
five, you would be on a spacecraft? Raise your hand if you would be on a spaceship for five years knowing that you were going to middle school. Oh, round trip. Oh. There's a lot of people who are Not only do they have incredible questions and they're thinking about what it means to go to space and thinking about the next generation and are here to hear the wonderful stories. And because there's a really great book out there, Never Panic Early. What's the Yes. It's ever new because and we've already gone over and we've thanked our sponsors. And we've talked a little bit about the history. I've butchered a story about Weatherford and why we're involved in the space <laughs> in oh. NASA things, which you would be really embarrassed about me. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I've collected some questions. And honestly, I think in the interest of time that we just start getting to the questions that the audience came up with, because we've asked a few questions already. But what we just again want to thank you for being here it is an absolute honor to have you on our stage and in our museum um, you all may not know that uh, mr hayes also plays an integral role in a science center in mississippi right and you can go and learn more about if you enjoyed never panic early you can learn more about mr hayes and the science center at fredhayes.space fredhayes.space you are probably the most active website owner, blogger <laughs> I know about space. So I really, really um, encourage people to check it out. All right, so let's see. And um, let me go back. And it, it, we've seen this thread about never panic early. And um, let me go back a little bit more. Ooh, let's go back even earlier. Earlier before all the things that people like to talk about, let's talk about your time at OU. Despite me going to OSU, we'll talk about this. So, do you have any fond memories of your time at OU? Uh, no, I, I actually... No, I'll just go with that. Yeah, I, I, went to, uh, I went to OU when it was uh, a lot smaller. I, I, I think the population of the main campus was not too much more than 5,000. So this was in 1956. I had already been, uh, at that time, I had two years of junior college in Mississippi and I had gone off four years in the military during the Korean War. So I was kind of an old timer. Actually, I was married and had uh, one, uh, one child already and another one uh, actually born here in Oklahoma uh, in school housing at North Campus in Old Navy Barracks. They converted them into apartments and uh, so that's where I, I lived. I rode a bike. Uh, most time to go to school and because it's easy to move around the campus and uh, drop just to leave your bike and uh, so it's much, much smaller groups than I assume right now it's, it's gotten obviously all universities have, it's grown uh, quite a bit and I saw a great football because I was there I saw I was at the game I shouldn't say uh, but I was at the game where they lost finally after what, 38 <laughs> 49. 49 consecutive wins. Uh, so I was there three years and saw one losing game. Uh, and I got a picture on my website. Those go there. That's Fred Hayes out space. You'll find I shot one picture of the football game. And there's Bud Wilkinson uh, walking down the sidelines. Wow. But it was, uh, it was, it was, I thought I enjoyed school. I enjoyed school a lot. And I was in aeronautical engineering. And I think I enjoyed it more because in the military I'd been a, a fighter pilot and two marine squadrons. So the aerodynamics meant more than just the equations to me. I could relate uh, to what I was uh, studying uh, a lot better having been a flyer and been, been in airplanes and appreciated more. 
Well, it actually it relates to a question that we heard from the audience, and that was how important was it to be able to do those equations when you were trying to solve these problems on Apollo 13, to be able to do those by hand and, and rely on your knowledge for that? Well, no, I didn't even use much aeronautical engineering. There is one, uh, and it, it's in the website also. It's a picture of a card out of a checklist, what's called a burn card. It's where we recorded one of the maneuvers we did. But at the bottom, there was, it was empty space. A remarkable thing was we had no blank paper on board. Uh, that changed for later flights. But uh, <laughs> at the bottom is a bunch of hint scratching, uh, grocery store arithmetic, and that's where Lovell had asked me, Jim Lovell, my commander, had asked me to compute. At the time I did this, could we make it back on uh, power, the battery power in the learn module and the water, for, for primarily for cooling the electronics, not for drinking. And so that's my grocery store arithmetic. I use it a lot with school children. Because I can say, you know, if you pay attention to arithmetic, sometimes you may need it. You don't have your calculator with you because calculators haven't been invented yet. Then. But uh, that, that's, uh, that's what one experience I had on the flight uh, that's been useful in, uh, in talking to schools and things. Fred, I need to back up on the OU information. A couple of things that uh, happened while he was at OU that are to the book as well. Um, he was living there on the North Campus, which is now Max Westheimer Field. And um, that's when the knocking came at your door one day from a guy down the hall. And what did he run to tell you? Uh, he, 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 I, was thought, I thought something was really bad wrong. Well, frankly, it had an accident or his family or something. And he uh, screaming that uh, something's up in space and it's beeping. So that was Sputnik. Sputnik. Yeah. Oh, While he was going to OU. Yeah, he had yeah. just heard it on the news. Yeah. Follow that up, another significant aspect of his time here in Oklahoma. Of course, you had to have the engineering degree to, to apply for test pilot and also, at that time, astronaut. But, you know, that, that was important. He got that engineering degree here, but he was also a pilot for the Oklahoma Air National Guard. And his commander, Stanley Newman, who was in the Air and Space Hall of Fame, the Oklahoma Air and Space Hall of Fame, Stanley Newman suggested that he apply with NACA, which during that process, it changed to NASA, right? Yeah. So without that, I don't know that Fred would have gone on to be an astronaut. He might have, but I would have probably gone to a company and made more money. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I joined that, uh, was, like I said, when Stan and I were talking about it, it was NACA, which was the predecessor to NASA, strictly an aircraft a flight test. And he recommended I go, and by the time I had uh, finished uh, OU in 59, it had become NASA. Stan incidentally recently passed away. I, know if you knew that. I tried to call him and his uh, son answered and uh, talk to him. But uh, Stan was uh, my commander uh, in the 185th Tank Fighter Squadron at the time, and a uh, great guy. Bill, we actually had a question for you. Okay. And that was, you know, you've done a lot of research with this book, and you've written a lot of books um, in collaboration with many astronauts and, and really integral space figures. Do you find that there's a thread that connects all of them together? Anything, any characteristics or threads that you're seeing? other than just immense bravery? Well, the, the thread for a lot of the Oklahomans, and, and I'm thinking in terms of probably a lot of the mission control guys who came from small town Oklahoma, like Colony or Corn or some of the smaller towns out west, Rocky, a lot of their connection was they had to be able to fix things right there on the spot. You didn't have repairmen that could come out to the farm and, and fix things. So they, um, they learned to be creative, to think outside the box, and to fix things with what they had, which came in really in handy with, with Fred's mission. Um, but that was probably the biggest common thread was they really knew how to work and fix things and think it through. And, and probably the other thing was they all talked about working in the fields and they said I got to get out of here 
<laughs> well, that's, a, that's such an important part of what you did, is problem solving and being able to think quickly. So how would you inspire children today? Um, how, what advice would you give to educators and to students to help promote problem solving? Well, I, I think it goes with that hand in hand is teamwork. Uh, and I, I think they do that in schools now, a lot of their projects. And that's uh, one avenue to uh, open that up that way that you have a, a, a small but an organization that's dealt with this situation and to try to deal with it. I think I know that you've used uh, some space scenarios as uh, a project to uh, worry about solving. And uh, that, that's, because it, it all requires that in, in any business today, a lot of things are done with teamwork uh, to effectively get the job done. So that's, uh, that's very, very important. And that's what we uh, had universally in the space program, not just uh, incidentally astronauts and mission control that uh, Bill was talking about, but in Apollo days, at least broadly, all the way to Somebody the contractors front. We had, uh, contractors uh, all over the country. Uh, over 400,000 people worked on the Apollo program. And uh, Na NASA, you realize, does not itself, the NASA does not do the design development of the spacecraft. Uh, NASA is a manager that oversees and imports to the requirements for the design and oversees that design progress. And of course, worries about the money and the schedule. But uh, it's really that those companies that NASA has contracted to do the things to get done that uh, is where the, where the real, I call it, ground floor of brain trust is for the design, at least, uh, design development of the vehicles and the hardware. It's, it's just an incredible creative process, yeah. too. Um, so how, just thinking about overall, have you, has your perspective of life changed after Apollo 13 and what you went through? Has my mind changed? About Pers perspective of life, just the way, did you come back with a different uh, appreciation? Well, it, it, uh, in, a, in a way it has, as you get older, uh, and I'm approaching 90 years old in November, uh, I, and, it's, and I didn't want to leave a uh, negative cast in the book, but I, I uh, spoke to three uh, problems uh, that uh, human, and it's more in the sense of the earth and the human race has to worry about. One was uh, part, part uh, global warming was one. Another one is the uh, threat in, uh, of asteroids, meteorites, or comets eventually impacting the earth. Uh, and us de 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 developing, uh, kept, and we started that. We had a mission called DART that actually went up and rendezvoused with a very large meteorite that had actually a little moon around it, and it went in and impacted the moon. And I really wanted to see now, if by impacting the moon with that known energy of the impact, how much it deviated its path. Because uh, if you're gonna use that to deviate a micro, uh, meteorite, you need to know how much energy to uh, impart to uh, affect what path uh, change you want, or trajectory change. So there's some work going on that way, but we really don't have what I call a vested uh, defense system. Now what I'm talking about, no one should get nervous here, because uh, <laughs> when I'm talking about a meteorite or a comet or whatever hitting, it may be a lots and lots of years in the future. Uh, we're, we're tracking it uh, up to the sizable ones now. We have a satellite, the later one went up to track even smaller size. Comets are kind of sneaky though, because they're on huge orbits. Uh, Prince of Comet West uh, came by about 10 years ago. It's next time it'll be back will be about a million years. So we don't know that it's comets on trajectories, large trajectories that have us as a bullseye right now that we don't even know exist. So they're a, they're a different kind of a character than the asteroids and meteors. And uh, it, uh, of course, the global warming is also impacted by uh, population growth which has happened on Earth. Uh, at the time I was born, uh, the Earth was about uh, two billion. Uh, we just hit eight billion people on Earth, uh, wor uh, worldwide. So, you know, we think the Earth is uh, infinite and it can support, but uh, at some point, there needs to be some worry about that. And of course, that directly is impacting global warming. Uh, so, 
there's that uh, that concern. The other thing I was worried about too, and that's maybe even worried in the near term, is the fact we have nuclear weapons. Too many of them by too many people. There's at least, I think, about 12 governments have nuclear weapons. Uh, we don't know the uh, gov government forms. Uh, there are all varieties, some dictatorships, uh, some republics or democracies. Uh, but we, uh, we would not have any control over it. And so I worry about uh, that, having that, all that availability uh, across the world of that kind of weapon. So that's the other thing I'm concerned about. Directly, because I was called up uh, again when I was in the Air Guard, I was called up in Ohio into a unit 1961-62 during the Berlin crisis when also the uh, missiles were put into Cuba by Russia. And I was in a special weapons outfit and uh, my unit didn't go overseas, but our Columbus unit did, went to Etain, France. And all these units, including Air Force active duty, were, were preparing uh, plans to deliver a nuclear weapon. I, for practice, I did a, uh, a target practice, assuming I would leave the, uh, Columbus's a 18 and deliver a nuclear weapon on Prague in one of the Eastern Bloc countries. So I did all planning for the low level uh, run in to uh, deliver that weapon, which would be about 84F was the aircraft at the time was flying. If you could deliver a weapon about two and a half times Hiroshima. And of course, that's not a big weapon anymore. Uh, so that's, uh, that's a concern that uh, we humans have not invented something that at the time seemed the right thing to do to prevent the number of casualties we'd have had ev evading Japan. But now seems like uh, we've, we've set the uh, set this thing in a box that we're worrying about the lid coming up open someday. Well, that's, that's one of the things I think that's driving space exploration now is limited resources, the what's going on on our planet currently. And so do you ever envision a time where we really could colonize? And would you volunteer for, a problem, for, <laughs> for going to Mars? <laughs> now, Mars is... Uh, much people think, well, we went to the moon, and so without understanding uh, the length of time involved and uh, the kind of vehicles and things you would need and how to operate on the surface, which you learn more of with the robots that have landed on Mars, it's much, much, much more difficult than going to the moon. It's a long trip, even with current technology, uh, uh, by about eight months. To go there, and then if you're going to stay a while and do something, uh, then it's going to face you eight months back. Those that have seen uh, the, the things that have landed, uh, the terrain and the countryside doesn't look particularly uh, beautiful or hospitable. <laughs> it's kind of like in the places in our southwest uh, where you know there's really very little vegetation and uh, and it has horrible dust storms. So it's, uh, it's, as it sits right now, it's not going to be a, it's going to be a tough place to go and live and operate. Uh, all that dust, for instance, is a problem if you go out in a spacesuit. You know, you got to worry about the seals. And, and even on the moon, the spacesuits, in between extra vehicle activities, when the crew took them off, they, and you had to wipe all the fittings and get the, even the lunar dust effect, worrying about the seals and the gloves, and the neck ring and all of that to make sure you didn't have leaks. And I can, can't imagine that on Mars, to, to <laughs> freely be walking around every day doing something and you're gonna have a big suit maintenance uh, issue. For instance, I'm just one example of things you're gonna have to deal with to operate there. So it's po is it possible? Yes, it's possible. Uh, is it practical in a sense of right now what we can support logistically? to maintain a base, uh, I don't see us there very soon. Right. Bill, would you go to Mars? You know, something Fred once said to me, uh, I found interesting. He, he's, you know, he loved the idea of going to the moon and that was just this, this great trip to be able to take. But he wasn't really interested in the Skylab aspect of it because it was such a long time up there. 
And so you got the same problem with Mars. Now, of course, Mars is a challenge. You, you might take that on, but boy, that, like you said, it's a right. long trip. Well, and the reason I wouldn't want to go to, on a Mars mission today is, <clears throat> uh, first and foremost, <clears throat> my uh, avid uh, love is aviation and flying and controlling the vehicle. Uh, most of everything today is automated. You don't even need a pilot to fly in the uh, Dragon, for instance, to go to orbit, to go to the space station. It's all done through computers. It's all automated. So a pilot is not uh, really a commodity that's needed anymore, for the most part. So, uh, and I'm sure even if I, if I flew that eight months to get to Mars, <laughs> and then had a lander when I got to land, and I bet they wouldn't let me to land. They'd do it automatically. <laughs> so, because uh, I'm, not, I'm not a scientist, so uh, I think for a geologist, or planetary scientists, that would be, you know, something that'd be burning to go do. But, we took uh, a poll in the audience, and there was many people that said that they would travel up to five years to get to another planet. Yeah. I wasn't one of them. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> um, but you talk about, uh, and you talk about a little bit of that in your book, about your love of flying and the controls. And one of the things that you said in your book, you know, you had to double check to make sure the computer was right. Whereas today, I don't know that the pilots would be able to double check if the computer was right. Um, you talked about the simulator program was trying to torture you. <laughs> it was more about checking to make sure you knew how to use the instruments and you knew how to fly. Well, it, that was just the time, the time and day of Apollo. Uh, we had not advanced as we have, and it's probably one of the things that was a big, I call it benefit, if you will, was how it drove the need for computing power, not so much in the, we couldn't do it in the spacecraft, but we did it like Mission Control had some of the very early big mainframes that IBM, and when IBM was pushed to uh, supply to do the, the, con the computations that were needed for Mission Control and data storage. On board, our big computer was one-tenth of a megabyte <laughs> memory. Think about how big your phone one -tenth is. One-tenth of a megabyte, it was hand-wired, there were no chips yet. So it's the core of that computer looked like a bunch of spaghetti, hand wired by, by ladies at Raytheon mostly. And uh, so that was our computing power for Apollo. We, everything mostly, and you saw that instrument panel with a lot of switches and knobs, those were not wired through a computer. Those were wired directly to the unit you control, be it the valve open closed, or the fan to select the alternate fan. So that was, we, we all, we manual control everything that way with a direct wiring 28 volt DC system. All our rocket, little rocket motors, we could fire them from the hand controller, hot wire direct to all the uh, little jets. Uh, we could stop and start rocket engines manually with, uh, with the hot wire hookup. Today, everything like that is, oh, goes through the computer on any vehicle you see, and, and a lot of it uh, is getting growing that way in your cars uh, with a lot of the auto automated features that uh, are buck systems in cars these days, automobiles. Well, think about the chip, short, the chip shortage that we just recently yeah. experienced kind of crippled yeah. us. Yeah. So, we have um, a lot of questions, not surprisingly, about Apollo 13 <laughs> mission itself, and particularly all the different things from the actual mission. How do you keep your a level head in a never panic early situation such as that? Well, I, I have to say Apollo 13, and, and people relate to that as you do with uh, the mission of Apollo 13, there, there were, really was no never panic early time. Uh, the event of the explosion, the initial manifestation that I saw as I got back from the lunar module where I was when this happened, into this uh, command module with Mothership. Uh, I was, it was a confused situation I saw with a lot of warning lights on, about seven of them. And uh, the other thing uh, I noted very quickly though was that we had two oxygen tanks, tank one and tank two, and tank two from meters showing in several instruments at the bottom clearly indicated we lost tank two. 
Now that in itself is not life threatening. We, I thought we had tank one, it looked intact. And so my initial emotionally feelings then was uh, one of uh, sheer uh, disappointment because I knew losing one of two tanks in a critical system like that meant come home as soon as possible uh, without reference in mission rules. So that was my first feeling. Of course, it was the confusion behind, right shortly behind that was now working with people on the ground as we slowly, and they quick picked it up quicker in mission control, that we had a leak that was also reducing the quantity in tank one. Uh, and that was big trouble because oxygen and hydrogen was needed to, con to feed the fuel cells. That was our electric power, primary electric power. The only other electric power we had was three small batteries that would only be used to get you through entry after you separated the service module with the fuel cells. So we, you know, they, they wouldn't last very long. So that was a big problem then. That kept us busy with troubleshooting uh, with things Mission Control wanted to try to isolate the leak in that second tank. And that went on for almost an hour before the was given up and we run out of ideas. And Jim Lovell and I were asked to go power up the LIM, the lunar module, and, and try to get it up and running so we at least have communication and environmental system going and, uh, and control. We had thrusters on it, the control attitude, to uh, now be able to work the problem now from the lunar module. Because it was clear the command module was going to have to be shut down completely, mothership. Never intended to be shut down, ever. And so that was poor Jack uh, Schweiger, we left, <laughs> Jim Bubble and I left alone, and he had that task to, uh, <laughs> to get the mothership turned down. Uh, it, was, it was interesting, the people in Mission Control, 20, by 25 years later, I went back and listened to their inner loop interchange within the room in their support room next to Mission Control, talking about that power down, how they were arguing technically and professionally back and forth about what steps they, because there was no procedure to power down, never supposed to be turned off. And they were worried right then about damaging something and not being able to recover. They were already thinking we're gonna get this thing powered back up, which they did four days later. Uh, we, they were worried already, they had not lost the ghost in other words. They were saying we, we gotta just preserve this vehicle enough so we can get a chance to get it powered back up and do the entry, even then. Was it as cold as the movie portrayed it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so did it, it got cold? Oh. It got, uh, well, it froze the water tanks in the mothership, which we shut down. Uh, the water tanks were still found frozen when they inspected it, when they recovered it on board the aircraft carrier. The limb, I'm guessing, probably got down in about the mid-30s, Fahrenheit. After, it took about a day for the thermal lag to uh, go eventually slowly cool down to about that temperature. Uh, we put on uh, all our spare underwear, so I had three sets of underwear on. <laughs> Unfortunately, not thermal underwear. <laughs> and uh, I, Jim Lovell and I put on our lunar boots, the boots we were going to wear if we walked on the moon. Poor Jack didn't have any, so he had to suffer a little more. Uh, Would you change anything about the movie to make it better? What? Would you change anything about the movie to make it better? Uh, no, I don't, I don't think so. I, you know, I complained to uh, Ron Howard about uh, some of the uh, antics uh, of the, uh, my extreme throw-up. Uh, I had a spit-up in space sickness, and he had Bill Paxton doing a big barf uh, <laughs> in color. And uh, they had Jim Lovell hugging me at one point. Uh, they had the spacecraft going on out of control at one point. We were doing a so-called manual burn maneuver. And uh, Jack Schweiger and I having an argument. Uh, none of that happened that way. Uh, he, he, I cornered uh, Ron, and after that, I saw a private showing of the movie. And I asked him, why, why did you put that in there? And he said, well, I listened to uh, all the air-to-ground radio transmission, as well as a lot of data NASA had provided us before starting the movie. And he said, it never sounded to me when I listened to all that you ever had a problem. <laughs> So he said, I wanted to humanize you in some way. <laughs> it 
But anyway, I, I, I out of the ground was discussing the next procedure or a change in the procedure or so. And he was you know, he couldn't use any of that because nobody would understand what we were talking about. We were talking about vehicle systems and uh, how to set up for the next uh, manual uh, rocket burn or whatever. So that, that's what one, that was one thing I would take away. But other, overall, I thought the movie would tell a great story of the uh, situation that we were in deep trouble and a problem and a team had, was working to get it uh, get us home. Again, it, again, it wasn't that he couldn't show the team I mentioned that covered it went across the country. Some of them had a verbal consulting play into working those problems back at the contractors or even subcontractors that were called on. And some flown into Houston even uh, to, to work through some of these things that had to get worked around. And he, he just quickly told me, he said, well, in a movie, uh, you can only develop so many characters in the time you have, so. So they stuck with the good ones. Yeah, right. <laughs> Many people might not know that a museum played a pretty big role with that with that movie as well. The Kansas um, Cosmosphere did a lot of the movie props and did a lot of the replicas there. So museums are important. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, I mean, you're obviously very well known for Apollo 13, but your career around that is spectacular. Um, even we had a question about your time with the Air National Guard, and do you still keep involved with that, because with our guards in here, we have, um, not too far from here, we have your National Guard uh, area, so. Um, what, do you, what do you find really proud of your career outside of just what people know you for, for Apollo 13? Well, not many people know about the Space Shuttle program uh, to that extent, the early part. I actually left the astronaut office and uh, I'd gone off to Harvard Business School and was interested in long range in the getting into program management. And I left the astronaut office and went to work uh, as a, a special assistant to Aaron Cohen, who headed the Orbiter Project Office. So I really moved more to a program management position <laughs> through the four years through the development of Shuttle. So more in a man management, uh, reviewing the engineering design, I was a member of the engineering change board where that reviewed every change made in the design throughout its development uh, up through up through uh, enterprise uh, through criti uh, critical design review CDR it's called where you commit to go build it and through uh, PDR preliminary design review for Columbia it's the first orbital bird and then I got named to be the first crew to fly it to fly Enterprise. So it was very much a womb to tomb thing where I was part of hand, hands on in the development to get it built and now to go fly it the first time. Uh, I flew five flights on Enterprise where we were on top of the 747 aircraft and actually did three times, separated three times to do testing now as a glider on the way down to the lake bed at Edwards Air Force Base. Uh, business world, I'm, I'm proud of, uh, I spent 17 years in aerospace when I left NASA uh, at Grumman Corporation and then uh, we merged with Northrop and I ended up running two service companies, one for each company that I merged into one. And in Oklahoma I had uh, two uh, contracts worth mentioning, I had, I had the contract advanced Air Force Base uh, for 10 years. Uh, that was connected with the virtually the maintenance of the aircraft, the uh, the base support, the head civil engineering on that contract. Uh, for a while, I was the largest contractor in northern o Oklahoma uh, because when they closed bases, they moved work from the ones closed to other bases, Del Rio, and they moved some to, to advance. So I, my workforce increased from about 900 to about 1,200 people on that uh, job. I had a small contract at uh, Norman with the uh, Postal Service uh, Training Facility. That's uh, at a Marriott uh, facility there, uh, which I, in a book I talked to workers there, every time I visited, complained they wanted to do something with the ducks. They had a pond there and the ducks were messing up the sidewalks <laughs> they were having to deal with. It. And they wanted me to eat nod and give them the okay at midnight to go shoot all the ducks. <laughs> <laughs> I 
เป็นไปดีแล้วแต่ I had contracts uh, overall of a period of uh, 17 years in the company. I had over uh, 30 people at 30 sites. Uh, some overseas, I had the tech reps uh, worldwide, the Grumman and Northrop Head. So all the E2Cs, we sold uh, AWACS aircraft, the carrier base aircraft. Uh, I had people uh, for a while in Israel, they kicked us out pretty quick. Israel's a very confident, they decided they didn't need us. And so, but I had them in Egypt. I had people in Malaysia, Singapore, uh, Japan, France. We sold uh, E2Cs to France. So I had the technicians that were out to uh, take care of the airplanes. So there's a lot of exploration still going on. And do you have thoughts about NASA or Space Force or even the Artemis program that's in, in process right now? What's that, I'm sorry? Do you have um, feelings about um, where space exploration is today um, with NASA or Space Force and even the Artemis program? Well, Na NASA, of course, uh, is really fortunate the way it's bloomed with the uh, private business. SpaceX, uh, I shouldn't single them out, but they have really uh, had a successful, exceptional success uh, they flew this past weekend, I think it was, they flew, they did two launches in one day. And uh, they reused the first stage, one of the first stages, nine times, and reused it, you know, landed it, and uh, refurbished it, and turned it around. So that, that, that kind of, and they've done it obviously uh, with a smaller workforce, which really was the big cost of shuttle. Most people think it's putting uh, stuff in the fuel tanks. The big cost of shuttle was um, manpower, was the payroll. Uh, very heavy, heavily uh, manpower intense, both on the maintenance side at uh, Kennedy uh, and all the ground systems maintenance, not just the vehicle, but uh, also the training uh, back at Houston. And so there was a lot of labor uh, tied to the bill, Christmas, that we <laughs> severely reduced the workforce. But nevertheless, that, that, uh, they've done a good job. The others, have, I think, the one that launched, uh, air launch. Uh, going back in business uh, shortly to launch you know, within a couple of weeks. And of course, the one that just goes up and down, uh, Blue Horizon, has had a number of successful flights at this point. But you know, it's the kind of thing that it's space tourism. Uh, but of course, the more people get the view, uh, the better. And some of it takes a uh, pretty good dollar to fly one of its flights to those that aren't invites. And uh, probably influential people that I hope are impressed enough to, if they get there, get to talk to their congressman, uh, tell them how great space is. But Do you have advice for the young people that are, maybe are explorers of tomorrow, and if they were interested in going into a field of space or space science? Well, I mean, the field is wide open. Um, you know, you think of, uh, you think of uh, space, you think of the rocket ship, uh, the capsules, and the people uh, are, you know, the astronauts, or the trainers, but the really, the every, by every skill there is, it's needed. Uh, it doesn't just cover astronauts, uh, which a lot of people get enhanced with and think that's, that's where they want to become. But it takes a lot of engineers. Uh, it actually takes a lot of technicians. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's more than just uh, my, my the kind of contribution I had, it, a, lot more, a lot more talents needed. I try to influence Tilda on a simpler basis of taking advantage of the talent uh, they've been born with, that they're blessed with, and best figure out how to employ it uh, successfully in some direction, uh, which would frame their, you know, a career path that might require training, might require schooling, uh, uh, how, to, how to work up in, in a field that fits uh, what they're going to be good at naturally because of the talent they've been born with and uh, be more, tend to be more successful and more happy and uh, what they're doing feel good about the contribution they're making. Well, folks, this is a Q&A and a book signing, so we're yeah. going to have to wrap it up, but I've got one last question here. Um, between Ray Bradbury, Buck Rogers, and even Superman, um, science fiction comes up a lot in, in your book, and that the influence it had on you. 
um, what do you still enjoy science fiction? And if you do, do you have any recommendations? No, no, I, I enjoy science fiction. In fact, uh, Hollywood movies, uh, the movies I enjoy are like uh, Star Trek. Uh, because, because they, uh, you know, they, don't, they can defy physics and I don't have to, doesn't have to make me squeamish to see them defy <laughs> physics. Whereas something like, uh, what's the one uh, they had a space station? And, uh, Space Nines? Uh, was, uh, I forget, two leading actors, and they defied physics and what they were doing outside with spacesuits and that kind of stuff. So it turns me off. I, I'm actually cataloging errors uh, when, I watch, <laughs> when I watch a movie that's trying to talk about real space uh, today or whatever. Uh -huh. So I, I like to like much more the imaginary, more towards science fiction. Ray Bradbury, incidentally, I did mention in the book, I got him to be a speaker one day at a, a one uh, event, major event, the Space Congress in Florida. And I, I was chairman one year, and I talked to him and he come to speak. And I talked him, took him on a tour uh, to the space shuttle facility. Orbiter re getting ready to fly the next flight in a building called the OPF, which is like a big hangar. And he actually got under that vehicle and looked at it, and you could see some of the streaking on the tile, and uh, we had been in space before. And he broke down and cried. Because now he was seeing a real spacecraft, a real thing that had been in space. That, you know, he had written about a lot of things, but they were imaginary and the best his mind could describe. And now he saw the real thing. He was uh, just unbelievably impressed. Well, I think he feels the same as all of us right now talking to you <laughs> because um, it is an absolute honor to, to have this chance to chat with you and to learn about all the things that shaped you and your career and the things um, that you continue to do for us as a community. Thank you for being here as part of the museum. Um, just a few housekeeping rules. Um, we're going to try and go row by row for the signing so you guys won't have to like stand in line for the signing. You can stay seated and we've got some ushers that'll come by row by row. And um, we're gonna try and get to everybody. We've extended the time. Thank you to um, Silver and Bob for getting us um, pushed back on the flight. So hopefully we can accommodate everybody, but if not, um, we were talking about a nice deal where we can um, mail out signed stickers to go in the book um, so that everyone will have a memento for this wonderful day coming to Oklahoma. So we welcome you here, and we thank you for being here. Thank you so much to all of you for your patience.